1964. Uh, was it fun Easter Monday or Sunday? Uh, what, the start? When the start, yeah. yeah. It was actually, it was Easter Saturday, midday, and uh, quite a, a funny thing happened on that day. We, we had taken a restaurant in Fleet Street uh, for the press launch, and of course... Uh, we got all the press in there. What we didn't know is that this uh, restaurateur had been quite adventurous with his heating system. So he had covered the entire restaurant in copper, the walls, the ceiling. He had copper behind the decorations to heat the restaurant. Due to this copper, obviously, <laughs> no, I know what's coming. <laughs> no signal could get in. So I had this massive great... Zenith. I don't know whether you remember those radios. They were sort of a, a, an American-built set that was like some military purpose, but apparently you could get a signal from anywhere at any time. We, we switched this on around midday, and of course, absolute silence. Nothing came through, and we just thought, oh my God, something's gone wrong. Maybe the ultimate dreaded Admiralty ship has bumped into some other little ship floating out there. All kinds of dreadful thoughts, paranoia spread quickly. And I don't know, I, I honestly this day don't know what made me do it, but I, I lifted the zenith and I walked out of the restaurant, which is a little distance out into the street, followed by all these media folk. And we, the moment we hit the street, blasted. In came the sort of test signal, which was Ray Charles. And that's why sort of Ray Charles was uh, special. It was special to me because it was he was the person who turned me on to music, i.e. in the sense that I was sitting in a, a flat in London one day and in came Ray on an album. That, and suddenly you were converted in a way that... It's hard to say. It's hard to say how strong it was, but I just knew I wanted to be involved with, with music in a rather serious way. And so we, we used Ray blasting as the ship left. When it left the harbour and was coming around the coast, and it was all secret, nobody knew about it, because we were obviously terribly frightened that if they got to know about it beforehand, they would do some dreadful things. But this, this, the, 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 the tracks, we, we kept playing Ray Charles' albums because we knew that the only station that would be playing continuous Ray Charles music would only be Radio Caroline ship, so that we knew we could follow it. Government were always saying we're going to get a law to put these guys off the air. When did you realise that they're actually pretty serious about it? Well, I mean, the the, the idea of them not wanting uh, anybody to be broadcasting, which is a different era actually to now. And the difference is that I suppose in those days the control was in you know mostly in government hands. And they, they weren't too keen on uh, independent broadcasting, independent voices. And obviously, government itself depends on the, the public to vote it in and out of office. And I suppose a station that was very popular and listened to by more than 50% of the country was um, a little bit of a danger if it was going to be saying the wrong things. And I think that was the the motivation behind trying to get rid of us, trying to get us off the air. When, when they first announced that uh, they were going to bring in this new law and make it illegal for a British subject to have anything to do with Caroline, um, most of the other pirate radio stations said that they were going to continue broadcasting. Radio London notably said, we will keep going. Mm -hmm. You said Caroline will keep going. But gradually, as we got nearer to August the 14th, um, there was a little bit of bottle trouble uh, <laughs> going on with some of these radio stations. It was uh, it was extraordinary. I mean, it literally, it was it was stations were who were going to continue started to as the day because the feeling of taking on the government, the full majesty, you know, all of that. People got very nervous about it, obviously, and. Uh, each station, one after the other, started to say, you know, we're closing down. And, they, and basically, 
all of them. And listen, there were at, by that time there must have been nine or ten stations all around the country. The Scarborough Radio, Scotland Radio, this radio. I mean, there were a lot of ships out there doing it, and a lot of people were having a lot of good, you know, a lot of fun. Anyway, they all started closing, and then we got to the point of Caroline was. I mean, we never, we never said anything, but we're just continuing what we're always doing now. Obviously, a lot of the jocks who were going to stay that day, the actual day of the broadcast um, of the bill, they were resigning on air. Suddenly, guys had said to me, yes, we're going to go on with it. We were going to continue with it. We're resigning. And you had these speakers in the office and guys who said to me, we're going to go, said, I'm leaving the boat now. And so there were a lot of parties going on around London at the time with all the sort of Radio London parties and everything. I suddenly had to start shooting around these parties <laughs> looking for disc jockeys. <laughs> and uh, it was quite funny, you know, so going in and, and a bit of gloom in these places. And I was saying, like, anybody want, to, anybody want to do a bit of DJing? And that's how we got some more disc jockeys. And then, of course, the famous... The famous Johnny Walker <laughs> and a Robbie Dale and one other. Chris, Chris, Ian Perry. McRae, I think it was. Who? It was Ian McRae to begin with, who, who I think had been a newsreader on, on Radio City. But just going back before the 14th, yeah. when, when Radio London and other stations changed their mind and said, we're going to comply with this government law and we're going to close down. Did you waver at all in your determination to keep going? Did, didn't you get a bit more nervous? Did, did you ever think for a moment, maybe this is a bit of a too big a battle? Well, uh, I, I mean, I know it sounds like uh, insane to say I didn't, but I mean, I just never, ever, I genuinely never considered anything else. I mean, there was no question. I mean, you know, if they sort of started, you know, mowing us down with machine guns or something, obviously that would have been dramatic. But, I mean, you know, that would have been real serious. But it wasn't like that. I mean, I couldn't see... I mean, don't forget my... Um, I remember actually being in Carolyn House that afternoon. I remember Tom Mangold of the BBC being in the room and saying, you know, into the room and saying, like, is Caroline really going to go on? And I said, yeah, of course, you know, of course it's going on. And... Uh, you know, and they said, well, how do you see this thing? Well, I said, I see it two ways. I said, um, firstly, I said, if the, um, if, I said the positives, because I, I tend to look at the positives. I said, the first positive is, for the first time, the government is actually recognizing Caroline. So that's a huge step forward. Uh, because obviously, if they'd said, look, you know, the bill would have really had to contain one line in it, you know, Caroline is illegal, arrest us. Now, they'd been saying all the time it was illegal. Now suddenly they realized it wasn't actually illegal, but they were going to make everything, everybody who had anything to do with it illegal, which is what they did in the bill. You know, they said if you're English and you're a disc jockey, you can broadcast from Moscow radio, you know, and sedition against the government and fly back into Heathrow. But if you are an Englishman and you play a Beatles record on Radio Caroline, we'll arrest you when you come back to England. And that was a little bit strange and, and would have had problems with the Court of Human Rights and other international courthouses around the world. I mean, we could have pursued very you know, interesting legal cases. But in terms of, like, what did Caroline mean? I mean, it did mean a lot to a lot of people. I mean, it was like, on that ship, a number of, well, hundreds of disc jockeys over the whole period some very special ones who, you know, and I have to say, Johnny, to you, you were one of the lone ones, and that speech you made up on your own, a lot of people said it was made up for you at an advertising agency, but I can vouch that you spontaneously made a speech up, which was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and I remember we talked about it, and I said, what do you think I should say, Ron? You said, well, just, you know, just tell them we're going to keep going and play the Beatles. That was the only thing that you said with, with, as a suggestion that the first record we played after after midnight was the Beatles All You Need Is Love. Well. 